So yesterday I promised that there was a meaningful way to multiply two vectors together. And today we're going to start to talk about one of those meaningful ways to multiply two vectors together, which is called the dot product. By the end of today, we should be able to actually calculate the so-called dot product between two vectors. And we should be able to use the dot product for a variety of different applications. One of the applications is that the dot product can be used to determine the angle between two vectors and correspondingly to determine where two vectors are perpendicular to each other. Under what circumstances do the vectors intersect at a right angle? We can also use the dot product to calculate a physics quantity known as work. And we can use the dot product to calculate the so-called projection of a vector onto another vector. And we'll define that term projection as we get to that section. Okay, so yesterday we said vectors are not multiplied component-wise. However, the definition of the dot product is close to being a component-wise multiplication. If I want to calculate the dot product of two vectors, which is denoted by vector number one with a big dot between that and vector number two, all that we need to do is first multiply the components then add those products together. So for example, if I had a vector v1, v2, v3, and I was dotting that with a vector w1, w2, and w3, I would multiply the x components, v1, with w1, I would multiply the y components, and I would multiply the z components and then I would add all of those results together. And there's something very, very important to notice about the result of this formula. The result of this formula has no brackets. The result of this formula is not a vector. The result of the dot product is a single scalar, a single number. If you dot two vectors together, you get a number and not a vector. For example, let's take the dot product of the vector 2, 8, dot the vector 3 minus 1. So I'll need to take the product of the two x components, 2 and 3, the product of the two y components, 8 and minus 1, and then add them together. 6 plus negative 8, 6 minus 8, I get the number negative 2. No angle brackets no other components, just a single number. The same thing will happen in three dimensions. We have 9, 1, 0 dotted with negative 2, 1, 18. So I'll have 9 times minus 2 plus 1 times minus 1 plus 0 times 18. So this is negative 18, negative 1, plus 0. All in total, I get the number negative 19. Let's check out what happens if we take the dot product of a vector with itself. 4, 2, 3, dotted with 4, 2, 3. So then I'll have 4 times 4, plus 2 times 2, plus... 3 times 3, in other words, 4 squared, 2 squared, 3 squared. So 16 plus 4 plus 9 is 29. Notice something that's kind of interesting. 
If someone asked me not to take the dot product of the vector with itself, if someone instead asked me to find the length of 4, 2, 3, the length would be equal to basically exactly the same thing except with a square root on top. And this will remain true no matter what vector that you're working with. If you take a vector and dot it with itself, the result will always be equal to the length where the square root has been removed. So it will be equal to the squared length of the vector. That's the same quantity as the dot product of the vector with its own self. Let's go right away and let's talk about some of the ways that the dot product can be used to calculate various other quantities. And we will be focusing on just three, only three applications. Calculating the angle between two vectors, projecting one vector onto another, and calculating work done. Now, by no means are these all the applications of the dot product that exist. The dot product is extremely useful for a variety of different things. For example, in Calculus 4, which many of you will probably end up taking next quarter, we will be using the dot product to calculate the derivative of a function with more than one input variable. We also have some applications of the dot product in, for example, computer science. So why is math important for programming? Well, it's because even if 99% of the time you won't need it, there's a 1% chance that you might. And it's in those moments that separate out a great programmer from average ones. And if you do know your math, you'll know how to modify this donut to increase the size, change the rotation, or even make a cube instead. To figure out how to shade our donut, we calculate the dot product of the surface normal and the direction of the light. So as you can see, when the normal points this way, it's way brighter. And when it points that way, it's way darker. So the dot product will tell us how light or dark it is. So our first application that we're going to focus on in this class is for the angle between two vectors, or more generally, the angle between any two straight lines or any two straight objects. So we have two vectors, v and w, neither of them zero. Let's let theta stand for the angle between these two vectors. And let's assume that we're taking the one which is smaller than 180 degrees. To quickly sketch this situation, I have a vector v here. I have some other vector w. And I'm considering the angle between them. Not the one that loops all the way around from the back, but the one that's between them in the most efficient way. This is the angle theta that's being referred to in this formula. If you want to figure out the angle between those vectors, then you can get it by taking the inverse cosine of the dot product divided by the individual lengths of the vectors. In other words, theta is the inverse cosine of the dot product of the two unit vectors the unit vector v divided by its length, and the unit vector w divided by its length. The first thing that's interesting is that if the dot product between these two quantities happens to be equal to the number 0, what can I say about the angle between them? theta would be equal to the inverse cosine of 0 divided by the two lengths, which is simply the inverse cosine of the number 0. An inverse cosine of 0 is equal to pi over 2. So if the dot product between v and w is equal to 0, then the angle between the two vectors is equal to 90 degrees.
In other words, if v and w dot together and zero is the result, then the vectors must be perpendicular. Now, as of this moment, this, as stated, is a one-way theorem. If the hypothesis that v dot w equals zero is satisfied, then the conclusion that we can make is that v and w happen to be perpendicular. But in this special case, the reverse is actually also true. If you swap the conclusion and the hypothesis, and if you enter the situation knowing already that v and w are perpendicular, then as a result of the formula above, theta is equal to pi over two. So pi over two is equal to inverse cosine of the dot product divided by the lengths, which means that applying cosine to both sides, zero must be equal to the dot product and the only way for a fraction to equal zero is if its numerator equals zero. Now we have a word orthogonal. Two vectors v and w or are orthogonal if their dot product is zero. So why do we have this extra word orthogonal instead of just using the word perpendicular? Because orthogonal captures the case that either both vectors are non-zero and so they actually do have an angle between them given by pi over two But this word orthogonal also technically allows for the case that v and w are, maybe one of them is equal to the zero vector. which is usually written as the number zero with an arrow on top. This is the vector with zeros in all of its components. Either two zeros or three zeros, depending on the dimensions that you're working with. Now the word orthogonal is used quite heavily in mathematics. I tend to hear orthogonal used more often than perpendicular in the mathematics field. Okay, so let's get some exercise with this formula. And let's go ahead and let's find the angle between each of the following pairs of vectors. And we have some options in terms of how we can present our answer. It does have to be in radians rather than degrees, but we have the option to give either an exact answer with no decimals, or we get to give an answer rounded to three decimal places, depending on what might make sense for the particular exercise that we're working on. So for example here, we're interested in the angle between the two vectors 1, 4 and negative 3, 5. So on the side I've just made a quick sketch of these two vectors. The quantity that we're trying to find is this angle that is between them. So the first thing that we're going to need to do is find the values of all of the quantities that we need to plug into our angle formula. So we're going to need the dot product of the two vectors, one times negative three is just negative three, four times five is just 20, result 17. Now we also are going to need the length of each of these two vectors. So the length of one four is the square root of one squared plus four squared is equal to the square root of 17. 
and the length of the second vector, negative 3, 5, is equal to the square root of negative 3 squared plus 5 squared, the square root of 9 plus 25, which is equal to root 34. So our formula tells us that the angle in between these two vectors is the inverse cosine of the dot product, 17, square root 17, square root 34. Now you're welcome to go ahead, take this quantity and shove it into a calculator and get a decimal approximation for the answer that is allowed in this problem. But I want to point out that the angle between these two vectors is actually a very special angle. And to see that, I'm going to think about 34. 34 is the same thing as 2 times the square root of 17. So if I take the square root of 34 and multiply it by the square root of 17, then those two copies of root 17 will become a regular ordinary 17. And the square root 2 from the root 34 will be hanging around in the back. That 17 in the top and that 17 in the bottom cancel each other out. And so what angle am I calculating? I'm calculating the angle equal to the inverse cosine of 1 over root 2. And this is one of our unit circle values. This means that theta, the angle between these two vectors, must be equal in radians to pi over 4. In other words, there's a 45 degree angle between the vectors v and the vector w. Let's try it with the following example where we had the vector 1, 1, and we had the vector 3, 2. So the dot product between these two vectors is equal to 3 times 1 plus 2 times 1 is equal to 5. The length of the vector 1, 1 is the square root of 1 squared, 1 squared, root 2. And the length of the vector 3, 2 is equal to the square root of 2 squared, 3 squared. So that's equal to root 13. Now if we take the inverse cosine of the dot product, 5, divided by the two lengths, 2 and root 13, there's really no way to simplify that. So that we get one of the values from the unit circle that we studied back in trigonometry. I just had to go check email and now I don't remember what I was talking about. Uh, I think I was going to calculate the value of this angle using a calculator. This works out to be equal to approximately 0 0.198 radians as obtained from the calculator. Now, when you're doing these calculations, just be careful and make sure that whatever calculator that you are using is in the correct mode to give you an answer in the format required by the problem. So if you're using a TI-83 slash 84, you're going to need that calculator to be in radiance mode. If you're using Wolfram Alpha, you're just going to need to check that the result is given to you in radians as opposed to degrees. So be on the lookout for that. Okay, finally, as a three-dimensional example, let's consider what would happen if we were calculating the angle between 7, 1, 4 and minus 2, minus 7, 6. So to begin with, let's calculate the dot product between these two vectors. And we get 7 times negative 2. We get 1 times negative 10. And we get 4 times 6, which is 24. So this is negative 24 plus positive 24, result 0. So the dot product between these vectors is 0. And from that, we can conclude right away that the angle between these two non-zero vectors must be equal to 90 degrees or pi over 2. Now, as promised, one way to use this theorem is to 
calculate the angle between two vectors, but this can be used more generally to calculate the angle between any two flat or straight objects. Just as a simple example, suppose that we had two lines, one where we had y equals 2x plus 1, and one where we had y equals negative 3x plus 7. What is the angle, the acute angle in particular, between these two lines? Now what I've gone ahead and done is I've taken these two lines and I've graphed them on the xy plane. Just using the information that we've been given about the slope and the intercept. Uh, for example, the line y equals 2x plus 1 has an intercept at the point 0, 1, and then a slope of 2, so if I go over 1 unit, I go up 2 units, which brings me to the point where 1, we have x equals 1 and y equals 3. And then I did exactly the same thing with the line y equals negative 3x plus 7. The angle that we're trying to find is the acute angle that lives between these two lines. So I can think about this as the angle between two vectors, one pointing in the direction of the pink line, and one pointing in the direction of the green slash blue line. It's meant to be green, but there's blue underneath. So I'll call the left vector v and the right vector w. But a vector doesn't care about its starting position. And the angle between two vectors doesn't care about the vector length. In the formula, you just end up dividing the vector length out anyway. So the vector length doesn't matter. Angle between two vectors does not depend on the vector's initial point or on its length. So rather than finding the angle between the vectors v and w drawn in white on this picture, I'm going to see if I can find the angle between two other vectors that might be more convenient. I'm going to try and find the angle between the vectors, this yellow vector lying on the pink line, which I will call V, uh, maybe with a little star. Not the vector W, but the gold vector here, which I will call W star. Compared to the white vector v, the gold vector v star is basically exactly the same vector, except that it has a different initial position and it has a different length. Likewise, w star has just a different initial position and a different length. But neither initial position nor length has any effect on the value of the angle between the vectors. So I will find the angle between v star and w star. The reason why I want to take v star and w star is that finding the components of v star and w star is going to be a lot easier than it would be finding the components of v and w. Because v star is just the vector which goes from 1, 4 toward 0, 7, and I can find its components by going final point minus initial point final point minus initial point. So v star is the vector negative 1 comma 3. Likewise, w star has a very easy to see initial point and terminal point. w star goes from 0, 1 to 1, 3. So I do terminal minus initial, terminal minus initial, 
and I get the vector 1 comma 2. So let's find the angle between V star and W star using these components and using that formula. To say that the angle is equal to cos inverse of the dot product, the dot product being equal to negative 1 times 1, plus 6, 3 times 2, result 5. Uh, the length of V star is equal to 1 plus 9, square root. And the length of W star is 1 plus 4, square root. So this is another situation where we can actually simplify this. Pull one of the square root 5's out of the square root 10 to get a square root 2 times a regular 5. The 5's cancel out and I'm left with an angle of 45 degrees or pi over 4 radians. That's the angle between these two lines. To sum up how we answered this question, we basically found the most convenient vectors which lay inside each line. V star was a very convenient vector which lay inside the pink line, and W star was a very convenient vector which lay inside the green line. We found the components of those vectors and then we use the formula to find the angle between them. Now the second really important and useful application of the dot product is to do something called an orthogonal projection. The orthogonal projection of a vector v onto a vector w is notated in the following way. The word proj, short for projection, the vector v is at the regular height in the text, but the vector w, which we are projecting onto, is written as a subscript and it's underneath the v. There are several different ways conceptually to think about the orthogonal projection. Here's the first way to think about the projection of v onto the vector w. In this case, we think of the projection as a shadow. The shadow of the vector v as cast onto the line which contains the vector w. So this is where the name projection comes from. Back in the day, projectors used to show images by shining a light on a cutout, and the shadow cast by the cutout as the light was shining on it created an image on the screen. So in this case, for example, we have the vector w, let me just angle it this way, and I'm going to extend the vector w into an entire line. Extend w to a full line. Then we have some vector called V, which is being projected onto you. So maybe here is the vector V. We're going to shine a light perpendicular to the line containing W. So in this case, the line containing W is this green line drawn. So I'm going to take a light bulb and position it so that the rays of the light bulb are shining perpendicular to that green line containing W. Now when the light shines perpendicular to W, V casts a shadow. V casts a shadow onto the green line containing W. So here's the shadow of the head of the arrow. Here's the shadow of the body of the arrow. This shadow cast by V onto W is the projection of V onto W.
Now notice that the shadow is always going to lie on the line containing W, which means that the shadow is either going to point in the same direction as W, or it's going to point in the opposite direction as W. But in either case, the shadow is always parallel to W. There are a couple of alternative conceptual ways to think about the orthogonal projection. Uh, for the sake of time and for the sake of efficiency, I've decided not to go through those other two ways in this video in detail. Uh, I have written some notes about the other two conceptualizations down here. Uh, if you're interested in that, if you're curious about that, feel free to meet with me and discuss it over Zoom, for example. Now, if we have a conceptual understanding of the projection, not only does that give us a way to check our answers and make sure that they make sense, but we can actually calculate the projection in many cases without doing any numerical calculations at all. For example, suppose that we wanted to calculate the projection of 1, negative 1 onto the vector 0, 2. Okay, so the first thing that I want to establish is which of these two vectors is casting the shadow and which of these two vectors is receiving the shadow. The vector 1, negative 1 is casting the shadow. So the shadow will be cast onto the line containing 0, 2. And the answer to this question will be parallel to the vector 0, 2. The vector 0, 2 points two units directly up in the y direction. So here is 0, 2. But in this problem, the vector itself is not quite as important as the full line containing the vector. And let's sketch in the vector v 1 minus 1. Let's consider now the shadow that would be cast by v onto the green line if we shone a flashlight on it with the rays going perpendicular to the green line. And the shadow will look like this blue vector here. And from the drawing, we can see that the terminal point of the shadow is at the point 0, negative 1. So the shadow, the projection, has the coordinates 0, negative 1. But, of course, graphical methods are not necessarily useful for calculating projections in more complicated situations. It's more of a way of checking to make sure that your answer makes sense. So here is the algebraic formula that you can use to calculate the projection precisely. If you want to project the vector v onto the vector w, then you can take the vector w and scale it. Remember that the shadow is parallel to w, so the answer must be a scalar multiple of the vector w. And here's what we do. We scale it by the number that we get by taking v dot product with w and dividing that by the number that we get by taking w dot product with itself. Let's go ahead and let's calculate the projection of the vector negative 1, 1, 2 onto the vector 1, 0, 1. Now let's just take a step back and establish in the beginning what the answer to this question should look like. If I'm projecting onto the vector w, the final answer should have what 
quality? The final answer should be parallel, should be a scalar multiple of the onto vector. It should be parallel to w. We're going to need the dot product of the two vectors. So that's equal to negative 1 times 1, 1 times 0, and 2 times 1. So that's the number 1. And then we're going to need the dot product of w with itself. So that's equal to uh, 1 times 1, 1 squared, 0 squared, 1 squared, which is 2. So we take the number 1 half, 1 divided by 2, and we use that to scale the vector w. And we get 1 half, 0, 1 half. Now what if we reversed the roles of w and v? What if we projected w onto the vector v? In that case, what we would do is we would look for an answer which is parallel to v. In this case, we're still going to take the dot product of v and w. We're still going to get the number 1 as the result. But the denominator we're going to use is the dot product of v with itself. v dot v, which is equal to the square of the first component, the square of the second component, and the square of the third component. So 1 plus 1 plus 4 is 6. And the projection is equal to 1 over 6 times v, negative 1, 1, 2, which simplifies to negative 1 over 6, positive 1 over 6, and 2 over 6, which is 1 third. One of the applications of the orthogonal projection is to take a force vector and to determine what aspect, what part of that force vector is actually contributing something meaningful to a physical application. For a quick example, suppose we have a block which is sitting at an inclined plane angled 30 degrees below the horizontal. Now for a very, very quick sketch, on the side I've indicated the horizontal, which is just a flat horizontal line, and I've indicated the inclined plane, which is pointed 30 degrees below that. Now the force of gravity acts on this block. The force of gravity pointing straight down toward the center of the Earth. But the force of gravity as it acts on this block is not going to move the block at all in the direction perpendicular to the plane. Because in the direction perpendicular to the plane, there is an opposing force being exerted by the plane itself on the block, which is causing the object not to move at all down into the plane. However, this force of gravity will have some effect to potentially slide the block down the plane, and so there will be some amount of force acting in the direction parallel to the plane that is actually causing some movement for the block. So to get a read on how much of this force is actually moving the block, how much of this gravitational force is pointing in the direction parallel to the plane, the first thing that I'm going to do is I'm going to express the plane as a vector. And in particular, for convenience sake, maybe I'll choose a unit vector. Now we have the angle for this unit vector u. This angle is 30 degrees below the horizontal. So that would correspond to a theta, which is equal to negative 30 degrees. And so if I wanted to find, say, a vector of length 1 with that angle, I could just take the x component to be the cosine of negative 30 degrees, the y to be the sine of negative 30 degrees. So that gives me a cosine of root 3 over 2 and a sine of negative 1 over 2. So to describe the component, the portion of gravitational force which is acting parallel to this inclined plane, 
all that I need to do is take the gravitational force and project it onto the vector that represents the plane. So we have u dot u, which is equal to the magnitude of u squared. But since we set u up to be a unit vector, this is going to be 1. We have the force vector dotted with the unit vector. The force vector was equal to 0, negative 10. The unit vector was equal to root 3 over 2, negative 1 over 2. So the x components product is 0, and the y components becomes positive 10 over 2, which is equal to 5. So the projection of the force vector onto the plane vector, representing the aspect of this force vector, which is actually has the potential to move the block down the plane, is equal to this scalar 5, or 5 over 1 if you want to be careful, times the plane vector. Or 5 root 3 over 2, negative 5 over 2. So the last question that we have is, what part of this gravitational force is basically going to waste? What portion of gravitational force is acting perpendicular to the inclined plane and not moving the block down the plane? So if you want to find the portion of the force which has gone to waste, all you have to do is this. All you have to do is take the force vector and subtract the orthogonal projection. So if I take the force vector and I subtract the meaningful part, the useful part, then what will be left is the wasted portion. So the force vector is 0, 10, 0, negative 10. The projection was equal to 5 root 3 over 2, 5 over 2 with a negative sign. And so if I subtract these, I get negative 5 root 3 over 2, and I get negative 10 plus 5 over 2, which is equal to negative 15 over 2. Now let's check and make sure that this vector really is perpendicular to the vector representing the inclined plane. And by far the easiest way to check if one vector is perpendicular to another is to calculate the dot product of those two vectors. So if I calculate the dot product of root 3 over 2, negative 1 over 2, with the vector at negative 5 root 3 over 2, negative 15 over 2, then the product of the x components becomes negative 5 times root 3 squared over 2, and the product of the y's becomes positive 15 over 2. But because negative 5 times 3 is equal to negative 15, these two terms cancel out and 0 is indeed the result. And so we've concluded that if we take the gravitational force vector and subtract the portion which is parallel to u, then we will get something which is perpendicular to u. Now this which we've done in this particular instance will work in every single case. This result will always be perpendicular to you. So this provides us with a great way to break down a vector, such as a force vector, into parts, one part of which is parallel to a given plane, and one part of which is perpendicular to a given plane. Now the final application of the dot product that we will be looking at in our work is on work done. Now in physics, the term work has a very distinct meaning. It's not like our colloquial understanding of the word work, where it's simply, you know, effort. Work done by a force, represented by a vector f with the arrow on top, if the force f is applied to an object as it moves along a displacement vector d, the work done is defined to be the dot product 
f dot d. So here I am in a copy of University Physics with Modern Physics. And I just want to point out that yes, this is a real definition of a real physics quantity called work. Now their notation is ever so slightly different, but the overall message is the same. The work done by a constant force F on a straight line displacement that they're calling S with the vector arrow over top can be found by taking the dot product or what they sometimes call the scalar product of the vectors f and s. Now continuing to look at this text to see the actual uses and applications of work done. First of all, there is a relationship between the sign of work done and the graphical relationship between the force vector and the displacement vector. When the force vector and the displacement vector are pointing in the same direction, or roughly speaking in the same direction, then the work done is positive. If the movement of the object is in opposition to the direction in which the force is being applied, then the work becomes negative in that case. Now, based on that, we can imagine that the sign of the work has some effect on the object's speed. And so that idea is captured in the work energy theorem, which says that the work done is equal to the change in kinetic energy for a moving object. If the work done by a force on the object is positive, then the change in kinetic energy is positive and the object, roughly speaking, speeds up. But if the work done by the force on the moving object is negative and the force opposes the object's movement, then the change in kinetic energy is negative, so in other words, the object slows down. Fortunately for us, because the work is calculated with a simple dot product between the displacement vector and the force vector, it's really actually easy to calculate. For example, here, find the work done by the force vector, let's say it's given in components by one, negative one, acting on an object as it moves through the displacement vector, three, zero. So, one minus one dot three, zero is equal to the number three plus the number zero. So let's note that the work done is positive. So if we were going to use that work energy theorem from physics, that would mean that the object's kinetic energy would increase and the object would speed up overall. That concludes today's material on the dot product. We talked about how to calculate the dot product, and then we moved right into some applications of the dot product. First of all, to calculate the angle between two vectors, or more generally, to calculate the angle between any two objects which could be represented by vectors, such as lines or any straight object. Then we use the dot product to find orthogonal projections. And orthogonal projections can be used to take a force vector and break it down into parts a part which is parallel to a given plane and a part which is perpendicular to a given plane. Finally, we use the dot product to calculate work done.